Welcome everyone to today's Coyote presentation. Thank you for taking some time out of your Thursday afternoon or maybe morning if you're joining us from another time zone. Um, I am going to just jump right into our presentation today on coyotes. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Lara Milligan. I am the natural resources agent for UF IFAS Extension here in Pinellas County. Um, and I've been teaching about coyotes pretty much since I got here. It was the one, number one request from my boss when I, when I got this job um, to do coyote outreach because they were a relatively new species in Pinellas. And I know people are still curious 10 years later to learn about them. So I am continuing my outreach and education efforts. And um, so we will go ahead and jump right in. So for today's presentation, this is what I'm gonna be going over, just a, a brief history about the coyote, some, well, I usually say basic biology, but we kind of go into a lot of details about the biology, about coyotes, conflicts as it relates to coyotes, and then how we can learn to coexist with them. So jumping in with the history, this map I love, I think it does a really good job of highlighting how the range of the coyote has really shifted over the years. So basically there's a key down here on the, on the bottom left of the image, but basically the darker the orange, the more historical the range. So coyotes were historically found kind of in the cent central Midwestern United States. And then they slowly began their range expansion up to the Northwest um, and then a little bit to the Northeast and then most recently they expanded their range into this eastern portion of the United States and, and down south as well. So I'm assuming your next question would be, well, how did they do that and why did they do that? And there's a few factors um, that played a role in that. One big piece was the eradication of one of their major competitors or someone that's filling a similar niche and that is the eradication of the wolves. So wolves were a huge threat to um, agricultural, those doing ranching and growing crops. And there were actually government programs back in the day. You can see an old image here that where people were paid to eradicate wolves. And so as the wolf populations decreased, that presented a great opportunity for coyotes to come in and fill that niche. So, and, and also obviously less competition for the coyotes as well. Furthermore, as we were developing right throughout that time as well, and so these kind of forested landscapes were being transitioned, whether it was into ag lands or you know, more kind of urbanized areas more recently, the open landscapes are actually more preferred by coyotes. And I am gonna pull you guys um, to see how many of you guys have seen a coyote, but I would, be willing to bet, for those of you that have seen a coyote, it was most likely in an open landscape like a golf course or a cemetery. On top of that, <laughs> coyotes are really, really able to adapt because they do not have a specific diet. They eat pretty much anything they come across if they're hungry. Um, they're not strictly carnivores. They eat um, fruits as well, which actually make up a decent portion of their diet. And they also have a relatively large litter size. And we'll get into both of those a little bit more when we get talking about their biology. So I will try and keep it, I should have mentioned this at the beginning, um, somewhat interactive. Just, I know it's hard to stay focused on virtual learning platforms. So using the chat feature on the bottom of your screen, there should be a little um, like communication bubble icon that says chat. If you click on that, it'll open up a chat window. And I'm gonna be throwing poll questions at you throughout and you can just type in your response there and then I'll be able to see them. So here is your first poll question. It's true or false, 50-50 chance of getting it right. Coyotes have been documented in every county in Florida. I see lots of trues coming in. You guys are good with the chat. Wow, lots of responses and lots of smart people. <laughs> so yes, this is true. And unfortunately uh, for us here in Florida, there isn't really a statewide effort looking at or doing 
much coyote research, but we were able to look at several different studies to ultimately indicate or prove that there are coyotes now documented in every single county in the state. So there should also be a little raise hand icon at the bottom of your screen. You could also just type in the chat if you prefer, but how many of you guys have seen a coyote either in Pinellas County or in Florida, anywhere in Florida? You can either raise your hand or type in the chat. Wow, a lot of you have. Awesome. I mean, I think it's awesome. So hopefully you'll all think it's awesome by the end of this presentation. And if you haven't seen one, um, you know, it's probably honestly only a matter of time. And probably after this presentation, you might have a better idea of where to go if you do want to see a coyote. So we'll get into a little bit, or like I, I mentioned before, maybe a little, a lot <laughs> about coyote biology, starting off with their diet. I alluded to this before about them having a really non-specific diet. So they are considered omnivores. This is kind of in the order in which like small mammals would be make up the largest portion of their diet. So small mammals, things like squirrels and rabbits make up uh, the most of their diet followed by fruit and surprisingly insects <laughs> makes up a decent portion of their diet as well. They will even eat carrion or dead animals if they come across it and they're hungry. And then in more urban areas, AKA Pinellas County, <laughs> garbage and pet food also will make up larger portions of their diet. And I was, um, I always like to just check, look into the latest research before I do presentations to see if there's anything new to share. But um, one of the studies that I was looking at did make the correlation that coyotes whose home range, which I'll talk about in a little bit, but basically the area in which they live, if it overlaps with an urban setting, then their diet does tend to be made up of more um, anthropogenic types of material. So it just shows the human influence on their diet. Um, there was no negative association with that, but just saying like they do take advantage of urban food resources um, when it's presented to them. Now, in terms of size, Coyotes in Florida in general are smaller than coyotes like more up north. So for our males, their average size is 25 pounds and their height off the ground is um, only about 20 to 22 inches. So like when they're standing on all fours at their shoulders, it's 20 to 22 inches, which really isn't that big. Obviously they can vary. These are averages, but that should give you some idea of their size. This image on your screen was taken right in uh, Clearwater. So you can see the little coyote there split between the trees. And they grow pretty quick. So they reach full size in less than two years, which I don't know, in the mammal world, I feel like that's pretty fast. <laughs> they are, they're out throughout the day and, and night, but Technically speaking, we classify coyotes as something called crepuscular, which just means that they're most active at dawn and dusk. I added the but here because when I was doing, uh, reading up on my research this morning, a lot of the studies are now alluding to the fact that they tend to be less, even more less, even more less, less active during the day um, in urban settings. And so, while they are most active at dawn and dusk, sometimes they will be active during the day, but they're seeing that in an urban setting, that activity during the daytime tends to be less. So they're kind of just taking advantage of when people are not out and about is what the studies are alluding to. They are amazing hunters and survivors, which I've kind of been alluding to all along, but they're blessed with lots of good senses. Usually you don't get all of these, but they have really good eyesight, really good hearing and really good sense of smell. The smell probably makes sense because they're related to dogs. Um, most often you will see them in pairs, their mating pairs or like their small family groups. Less often they'll be just solo or um, in large packs. People often associate coyotes with wolves and think like, oh, they're gonna be in these massive packs. That's not really how coyotes operate. So um, I'd actually be curious, I'm 
I've never asked this question before, but for those of you, a lot of you have seen coyotes in Florida or wherever you've seen them. I'm curious if you want to type in the chat if, you, if they were alone, if there was more than one, or like how many you saw. You can type that in the chat. I've only ever seen them solo myself, so. Um, okay, and that seems to be the trend here. Awesome. And this is, I guess I should, I, I should specify, this is just how they operate. This isn't like based on people's sightings of them. So, you know, we might only see one at the time, but they're most likely or more often in a pair. We just only see the one. Ooh, Kathleen saw three or four. That's awesome. Okay. So in terms of their breeding, they only breed once a year and we kind of just got out of like having pup time. So they mate in the winter, usually like February, March, and then it's a two month gestation period having pups in April and May. And then their litter size, I mentioned this before, they have a large litter size. On average, they have six pups. So it's, <laughs> I mean, I feel like that's a lot, again, when we're talking mammals and I have seen different studies. One study mentioned 12 is the most that's ever been documented. I've seen another that says 13. So it can vary quite a bit. Again, six is the average. And what's really unique is that both parents will raise the young and they do that pretty much up until the pups are about nine months. So you, know, you do the math and that's getting back to them often being found in pairs because that's a, a long portion of the, of the pup's life before they start even breeding again. And they are um, considered monogamous, which so lots of rare things here with the coyotes in the, in the animal kingdom. And then the pups become sexually, sexually mature at age one. So if you do the math here, you can see how coyote populations can quickly expand. And now I'll throw another cool question at you. What do you think the average lifespan of a coyote in the wild is? And I gave you some options here, three to four years, five to six years, seven to eight, nine to 10, or 11 to 12. All right, we've got lots of variety of responses coming in. Okay, I wish I could like cue a drum roll. So the answer is five to six years in the wild, which really isn't that long and probably to their advantage why they can, you know, are sexually mature at age one and can have relatively large litter sizes. Now, what is unique about the coyotes is they have something called density dependent reproductive response, which is this fascinating thing that coyotes can do, which basically, Coyotes in a particular area can, depending on the density of coyotes in that area, if say there's the density is pretty low, then the mothers will tend to have more pups. And then if there's high density, the litter sizes will be smaller. This was really discovered when there were eradication efforts that went underway. <laughs> and they quickly realized that eradication efforts are pointless because as they removed coyotes, the populations would rebound extremely quickly because the litter sizes would be very large and the populations would just recover very, very quickly. So there's really no eradication efforts um, for coyotes in most cases. There are a few scenarios where it's um, effective, but typically we just focus if there is gonna be any type of eradication or removal, it's strictly for a nuisance coyote. Now threats, I saw somebody put in here, um, they've seen coyotes dead on the road. And unfortunately, car strikes really with most wildlife species is one of the number one causes of deaths for coyotes. Hunting and trapping is also um, a threat to them. And then predation by larger carnivores in other parts of the state. We don't really, the larger carnivores, I guess if you want to classify us as a carnivore um, would be us, but um, yeah, car strikes and hunting and trapping otherwise. 
And then I mentioned before their lifespan five to six years. And I did, I just briefly glanced over the chat. I also failed to mention this at the beginning, but I will address all questions at the end. Julia, who's co-hosting this with me, will keep track of questions. Most preferred is if you click on the Q&A icon on the bottom of your screen, you can type in your question there. That just helps us track them a little better and it doesn't get lost in the chat. Um, but either way, we will hopefully address your questions at the end. I don't want you to think we're ignoring you. <laughs> and then um, in terms of coyotes and where they live, you might've heard of coyote dens and they do utilize dens and they can vary quite a bit. They can use just kind of thickets of vegetation, hollowed out logs, trees tend to hollow out from the inside out, large brush piles if they're available. And then they will also take advantage and expand existing burrows of things like gopher tortoises or armadillos. Now they don't use these dens year round. They're only used to raise their pups for a few weeks. So uh, if you happen to come across a den that you think might be a coyote, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are occupying and using it at that time. Now there's been lots of studies looking at home range and I might have to update this slide. I, I need to do some more digging into the research because it, anyway, I'll try and explain it as I go on. But Generally speaking, so home range is the area or space that a coyote needs to find everything it needs to thrive and survive. So food, water, cover, shelter. In natural areas, what they're finding is that the home range is actually larger than it, coyotes that are living in urban areas. And you can, if you think about it more, it kind of makes sense. When I first saw this statistic, when I started teaching about coyotes, I was like, oh, I, I would have thought it was the opposite. But if you think about, you know, especially now, you know, it's been pretty dry. So if, if a coyote in the wild in a natural area wanted to find water, they might have to travel a significantly further distance than in an urban setting where we have, you know, in Pinellas County stormwater ponds, like every five feet, <laughs> um, you know, it's a lot easier to find the resources that they need in an urban setting. Now, the research that I was looking at this morning was alluding to the urban area range can vary quite significantly just depending like how fragmented the, the landscape is. And, and that's, I need to dig into more to that um, to understand it more, but generally speaking, this is the trend that we are seeing. On the left here is just one snippet of research that we have in Florida. Again, there's not a lot. So I like to highlight what we do have. They did radio track, radio collared coyote. This was a male and found that it traveled 40 miles and that's about all that we know. <laughs> we don't know why, we don't know if this is what most juvenile males do, um, but it just highlights that coyotes can travel significant distances. Okay, now we're gonna play a little highlights magazine game virtually. And these are real tracks that we've taken here. My office is stationed at Brooker Creek Preserve in Tarpon Springs. We have both coyotes and bobcats here. So on the left, we have some coyote tracks. And on the right, we have some bobcat tracks. I'm trying to outline them with my mouse if you can't make out where they are. And so what are some differences that you guys notice between these two tracks? And I'll give you a second again, you can type in the um, chat box. Okay, toes, separated toes. Whoa, they're coming in fast now. <laughs> nails, claws, nails. Toes are closer together on the coyote. And coyotes are more pointed. You guys are good. Yes, okay, so yeah, you pretty much got them all. So for coyote tracks, one thing that we always look for are the claw marks, which you can see here and a little bit here. The way a coyote walks, they tend to only, the top two um, claws tend to track in the sand. Sometimes you can see um, all four, but usually you can at least see the top two, which 
in Bobcat tracks will pretty much always be lacking. And that makes sense for those of you that might own cats or dogs, you know that dogs' nails are always out. They don't have the ability to retract their claws like cats do. Um, and so when cats are walking, their claws are retracted and they typically won't leave a mark in the, so in the soil. Somebody also mentioned that their toes are very close together. And yes, that is one thing that we always like to emphasize is if you were to outline a coyote track, it tends to be more oval. So their tracks are actually longer than they are wide compared to a bobcat track that if you were to draw an outline around it, tends to be more circular. And I think those are the main things that were pointed out. There's lots of responses, which is great. So I'm trying to make sure I didn't miss anything. Very good. So, and this just highlights that um, kind of oval shape a little bit more. This is now comparing a coyote to a domestic dog. So again, right, these are related um, species, but again, the coyote track tends to be much more narrow than a domestic dog. Now, obviously there's like hundreds of different dog species. So I'm sure some have a more narrow track, but generally speaking, coyotes are gonna be longer than they are wide. And one other thing is if you happen to have like a, a long, set of tracks where you can see kind of how they've been moving and walking. Coyotes are not going to waste time. <laughs> they, their paths are going to be very, very straight. So their set of tracks will almost form a line if you were to connect the dots. Whereas a domestic dog, if you think about dogs, they're kind of just like, well, you know, wander over here, go over here. So their, you know, their paths are kind of going to be all over the place. So those are a couple things that you can look for. And then um, for those of you that do have dogs and get to pick up their poop, you know, hopefully it's not containing any hair in it, but that is one thing that tends to be quite obvious with coyote scat. And then I don't know whose job it was to go out and measure all the coyote scat, but um, if you wanna become a scatologist, I guess you, you could do this. <laughs> the average length of coyote scat is determined to be four inches long. Now, their diet, I mentioned before, you know, they're omnivores, they eat a whole wide variety of things. And so their scat's going to be quite variable depending on what it is that they're eating, similar to us, and I'll leave it at that. But um, this isn't like, this picture here isn't what it's always going to look like. I guess one other thing I'll say is, in the wild, like if you take domestic dog out of the picture, probably the only other scat that would look similar to coyote scat is bobcat scat. And the way that we differentiate those two is that bobcat scat tends to be much more obviously segmented. And for those of you that have cats at home and clean out the litter box, you, you know what I mean? Just the way that they deposit their scat makes it um, appear to be more segmented. Okay, and now we will jump into coyote conflicts and we'll start off with another 50-50 true-false. Coyotes cannot transmit diseases to humans, pets, or livestock. Look at you, you guys are fast on the chat. All right, there's some mixed responses coming in, but mostly false. So majority of you are correct, it is false. And it's kind of one of those like double negatives. So I know that's <laughs> somewhat tricky, but um, coyotes can transmit diseases to humans, pets or livestock. Now, I, that being said, it's not like something that happens very commonly or regularly, or you hear a lot more about it on the news. But if you think about your domestic dog versus a wild dog, the coyote, right? We take our domestic dogs to get treated for all of these different um, diseases and worms and, and everything you see here on your screen, whereas obviously coyotes are not getting that treatment. So they can carry a variety of diseases and be host to several different types of parasites, which can be transmitted. Um, but again, the likelihood of that happening is very low. We're just pointing out that they can. In general, and 
I don't know if this slide is relieving to you or not, but um, it's relieving to me. But the risk of for coyotes posing any form of threat is greater to pets than it is to people. And um, that's mostly because it's, right, it's like dog versus dog. It's usually some type of predatory response. And um, the good news is there's really easy ways to fix that from being a risk at all. So for cats, like I can never say I can 100% guarantee something, but this is my 100% guarantee to you that if you keep your cat indoors, I can 100% guarantee that it will not be eaten by a coyote. I suppose unless you went out and caught a coyote and brought it in your house, but <laughs> um, obviously we can't keep our dogs indoors all day. So what we do recommend, you know, keeping a close eye on your dog, especially if you know coyotes are in the area. And we do suggest if, um, I know there's lots of um, codes and ordinances with as it relates to leashes. So, you know, obeying those, number one. But number two, we suggest a six foot, nothing longer than a six foot leash. And that keeps your dog close enough to you that hopefully between you and your dog, you know, that would present enough of a threat to a coyote. And it prevents your dog from running, like those leashes that extend really far. Um, if they are run, like say they, see a coyote and they start to take off, that's gonna trigger a chase instinct, instinct by the coyote. And so if we can avoid that, obviously that's what we wanna do. This is somewhat of a no brainer, but um, we see it happen all the time with all sorts of different wildlife species, but we definitely do not want to feed coyotes. That is what um, leads them to become what we call habituated to humans. They get more and more comfortable. They associate people with food and that ultimately will lead to a negative encounter. Now, again, I mentioned before, they pose more of a risk to our pets um, than they do to us, but <laughs> your pets pose more of a risk to you than coyotes. So this slide, I always like to just give people time to digest. The things that we live with and purchase and pay for and keep alive are more likely to bite us than coyotes that a lot of people are, are, are very fearful of. Um, I will say that I guess the way that coyote bite, bites are documented or the lack thereof, it's, it's not the easiest to find. I was just reading the, the study in which this number was um, retrieved from uh, and, and you know they did the best that they could. Either way, um, I think it's, it's very obvious that your risk of being bitten by a dog is significantly higher than being bitten by a coyote. So hopefully that brings you some relief. I will say I am one of these statistics over here on the right. <laughs> um, now, how can we learn to coexist with coyotes? There's several things that we can do, some of which I've already alluded to, but I will stress and emphasize again. So right, okay, never feed coyotes, and really that goes for any wild animal. Preventing access to your garbage and pet food is huge, especially in an urban area like Pinellas County, and that is going to help with a variety of potentially um, nuisance wildlife species like raccoons and um, possums and things like that. If you have the ability to not put your garbage out like overnight and give animals all that time to access it. Um, and you can like leave it inside your garage until the morning, that's best. And if you are one to leave pet food out overnight, maybe reconsider and bring that pet food in and then just put it back out in the morning. Keeping your cats indoors, again, easy, simple solution. Watching, especially if you have small dogs, small dogs are more similar to what coyotes would typically eat for that small mammal category and portion of their diet. So you definitely um, wanna keep a close eye if you have smaller dogs and larger dogs, they're obviously more like at the competition predatory level. They're just thinking like, hey, stay out of my, stay out of my um, territory. If you do get approached by a coyote, we, stress and emphasize, which will be on the next slide, something called coyote hazing, which I know sounds horrible, but the whole goal is to reinstill fear in that coyote, because if they're approaching you, then they obviously do not have fear of humans. So we encourage you to basically, I say, act like a crazy person. So you wanna wave your arms, shout really loud and act in an aggressive manner. Your goal is not to cause any harm to the coyote, but simply to scare it. If you do have um, small pets or children with you, 
when you are approached by a coyote, definitely try and pick them up because again, of that chase instinct. If your small child runs away or your small pet runs, that's gonna trigger the coyote to chase. Not in all cases, but definitely something we want to avoid. <clears throat> Now this next point on here, crawl, closing off crawl spaces underneath your porches and sheds. Coyotes in urban areas will take advantage of those spaces for potential den sites. And some people might think that's cool. So you can, if you wanna encourage coyotes to you know, utilize a den underneath your porch or shed, then you don't have to do that. But if you're like, uh-uh, no way, I don't want coyotes anywhere near me, then you could consider closing off those spaces. Again, teaching your children or grandchildren not to run if they see a coyote. And then I always say this in all my programs, I am one person with a mission to educate a million people in Pinellas County. And I, there's just no way I can do that. So I need to rely on you to help me spread the word by sharing what you learned today. Now, <laughs> this slide always like perks people up because some of these things sound extreme, but coyote hazing, again, is like a real thing. You can look it up, and um, especially in areas where coyotes are a lot more prevalent than here in Florida. But these are some things that you can do if you know you have coyotes in the area, or especially if you know you have coyotes that are like starting to get closer and closer to people. One thing you can do is to keep bear spray with you when you're out and about on a walk. They typically have like a little clip you can just put on your belt. Um, if you're out in your yard, you can use a hose or a water gun to spray water either at or toward the coyote. Water is not going to harm the coyote. Again, it's just to scare it off. Anything that makes a loud noise. I, I know you probably don't want to be that neighbor, but air horns, um, a whistle. You can make something called a coyote shaker, which is basically just taking any aluminum can and putting rocks or pennies in it. And that might surprise you how loud of a sound that that makes. It's a cheap and easy noise maker. Now these next few, throwing a stick or stone, a paintball gun, and the walking stick or golf club might be like, that sounds intense. <laughs> um, and it does, but again, I'm gonna stress and emphasize our goal is never to harm a coyote. This is simply throwing an object toward the coyote to scare it off. We don't ever wanna hit the coyote. The walking stick or stick or golf club is really just to make yourself look larger. And that's also, we put golf club on there because as you can see from this picture, and like I alluded to, to before, they tend to really like open landscapes. And so if you're on the golf course, you're likely gonna have a golf club with you. Pink ball gun, again, is um, simply to shoot towards the coyote to scare it off um, and not to hit the coyote. And they actually, one of the studies I was reading was looking at a specific nuisance coyote and they implemented coyote hazing practices, one of which was the paintball gun. And they did highlight through their efforts and the, their tracking that the coyote hazing was effective. So one thing they do stress because coyotes are incredibly smart is you need to use a variety of these things. You can't always like whip out the air horn because they're eventually gonna figure out like, okay, you're just making a loud noise. Um, so you have to use a variety of these things or they'll figure it out. Now, I want to stress and clarify this slide before you just like go writing down to contact um, what we call FWC, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. So if you do have a nuisance coyote, a coyote that's consistently getting closer to people and making, you know, coyote hazing is not effective, then through the FWC, they provide um, a wildlife trapper list. I think you can get it sorted in a variety of ways. I usually just go, it's sorted by county. So you could click Pinellas County and it lists all of the, cert, not certified, the um, wildlife trappers that have been kind of like vetted through the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. They're all listed on there. It'll have their contact information, what species they will trap. So not all of them will do coyotes. And then you can find a wildlife trapper that you would personally have to pay out of pocket. There's nothing that the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission will come out and do in terms of removing a nuisance wildlife um, or nuisance coyote. So I know I ran through that um, pretty quickly, but I, I know there tends to 
be uh, lots of questions as it relates to Coyote. So I like to leave time for questions and nobody ever complains about getting done early. So with that, I will hand it over to Julia and see what questions we have to answer. Oh, no, right here on the screen. Julia is gonna push out a quick poll to you guys. Um, so if you wouldn't mind taking a minute or less to answer that, and then we will jump into Q&A. Okay, we're going to leave the poll up for about 30 more seconds and then we will get into Q&A and if anyone has any questions, now is the time to put them in. Okay. Okay, Lara, our first question today is what is the carrying capacity per acre, um, rural and urban? <laughs> That's an excellent question that I wish I had the answer to. Um, unfortunately, I, I have yet to see any research on that. That is one of the limiting factors with coyotes is just that there's not a ton of funding to support research. So we just don't have a lot of answers to the questions that we want. Um, like I had somebody ask me like, how many coyotes do you have in the preserve? I'm like, we have them. And that's all I can tell you. Like we just don't have the data. Um, so really good question. I will see if I can find any research related to that, but I have, I personally haven't seen anything documented on that. Thank you. Um, and this person lives near the preserve, lucky you. Uh, and they've noticed that coyotes are very active um, howling and yelping during a full moon. Is that a hunting behavior? So that's another good question. I also, I have not specifically read research on that. My educated guess would be um, that the, you know, just simply the light allows them the opportunity to move around <laughs> a little bit easier, but um, I don't know if there's like a bio biological factor that plays into that. And you guys are giving me some really good <laughs> homework and these are really good questions um, that I've never been asked. So I will see what I can find out about that, but a really good observation that you've made. And yes, lucky you to, to live near here and hear that. Wonderful. And this next question, um, you did touch on it, but it was asked earlier in the program. Um, they walk in the morning early, 5.30 to 6.30. And what should they do if they come into close contact with a coyote on a morning walk? Yeah, so the, the main thing is you wanna make sure that that coyote goes away. <laughs> So you need to just do whatever, if that's making a loud noise or even like running towards the coyote kind of quickly to startle it off. Um, but the key is just to instill that fear back in. Now, if they like see you and dart off, then that's fine. But um, the key is just making sure that they know, I guess, know who's boss, if you want to say it that way. <laughs> Wonderful. All right, next question on predators. What is the hierarchy between bobcats, coyotes, and foxes? Um, this person has seen all three on their property next to the preserve. Good question. So I used to, I used to have a slide in here that talked about this um, because bobcats and coyote in terms of their prey, it, it overlaps. Um, but so I, I always use like a UF. If, so sorry if you're not like a football person, but hopefully most people at least know the University of Florida and the Seminoles are like rivals. So I say like, you know, they're all there for the same reason. We're all here to watch the football game. So same with the um, bobcat and the coyote, like they're all in the same place to do the same thing, but they're just not gonna cross territories. Like the Seminoles are gonna stay over there and the Gator fans are gonna stay over there. So they just kind of have this like, I don't know, natural respect and, and don't really tend to overlap their, um, their territories. So I don't know, they figure that out on their own. I don't honestly have a ton of information on foxes either. It's not a very um, common species that we see here outside of the preserve. Um, so I 
don't know on that one, but it, it doesn't seem like there's any significant competition between those species. Thank you. And how fast can a coyote run? <gasps> That's an excellent question. Man, I'm, I'm like, I feel like we shouldn't even do this Q&A because I'm just going to take thing I don't know, but I have never seen that documented either. So I'm going to see if I can find that out. I'd imagine they can run pretty fast, but I don't right. have an actual answer. Google's first response said 35 to 43 miles an hour. So wow, pretty fast, if that's correct. <laughs> I, we can yeah, send some follow-up information to everyone though on that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and um, this person hears coyotes in the field by their house. Can they jump a four foot fence? Absolutely, I do know the answer to that one. Um, they can even jump a six foot fence. Really in order to prevent a coyote from jumping over a fence, you'd have to have a significant like in addition to the vertical, you'd have to have a significant overhang as well, which just really isn't feasible for most people and definitely not aesthetically appealing to most people. So um, yes, to answer your question. Wonderful. And do coyotes eat birds? Yes, <laughs> long story short. Yeah, I know I didn't like specify that as one of the items um, in there, um, but they will take advantage of birds. Pretty much anything you know, they're able to catch if they're hungry. So if there's especially like ground nesting birds, um, they will take advantage of them. I wouldn't say it's a significant portion of their diet or it's not very common, but they will. Okay. Are there any animals that prey on coyotes in this area? That's a great question. Um, my only, I could see a bobcat potentially going after a pup, but at like a mature coyote outside of humans? No. Awesome. Okay, and we are just down to our last couple questions. Um, do coyotes get rabies? Yes, yeah, so good question. They do and can um, carry and transmit rabies. And um, it's just not, it's not a super common thing that we see, but they definitely can. Okay probably not try to scare that one off. <laughs> um, and last question. Oh, two more. How long does a coyote live? Yeah, so the coyote in the wild, it's the average is five to six years. So not super long. And this is a little off topic, but a good question. What should someone do um, if they see a raccoon roaming around their home during the day? Should they contact somebody? So good question. So raccoons are also a species that has been able to adapt pretty well to living in an urban setting. Um, so there's no real call for concern if you see one out during the day. They've just, they've learned somewhat opposite to coyotes is that like when people leave to go to work is their prime time to go explore your garbage can or see if you left pet food out. So they've just adapted um, to take advantage of that. And so it's not, not a cause for concern if you see them out during the day. Wonderful. And um, that was it for the questions. There are a couple questions about being able to watch this presentation. It has been recorded um, and it will go on our YouTube channel. We have a YouTube playlist. It's uh, Brooker Creek Preserve and I can put that in the chat as well. And that is it for our questions. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for tuning in and I'm gonna go do some homework and uh, <laughs> next Coyote presentation, I'll add these in. So thank you guys for the great questions and I hope you guys have a great rest of your Thursday.